I, I promise to do the best that I possibly can. I promise, but uh, that that's all I can do. It's just promise to do the best I can. I'll accept your promise. If my for best now. isn't good enough. Then yeah, you should yeah. have lower expectations. That's right. I tried my best, but I guess my best wasn't good enough. All right, FBI uh, Miami firefight lessons learned. We got Q and A. If you are uh, in the the not, I was about almost said Slack. If you're not in the Slack, if you're in the Discord, if oh. you are in the Discord and you want to ask a question, well, just go crazy. And Zach and Jared will monitor that. And let me know if you have anything important to say. Uh, sometimes you do. Sometimes it happens, and and you. You know, if you have a conversation, I had a conversation. I had several conversations, actually, this last uh, week. Uh, and some of them inspired, well, they inspired me to think, well, I should, I should probably talk about that. That's something we should discuss on the radio or on the, I've got a Legion of Michael topic coming up uh, for you guys. All right. So uh, let's see. Keep your eyes on a swivel. It's time for Zach. Well, actually, you want to do that after the opening music set. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, proudly brought to you from the SDS Import Studio. If you want quality that's affordable, visit sdsimports.com. We don't just talk guns and gear, we also discuss current events and politics, because guns are politics. Now sit back and listen louder to your co-host, CEO of Full 30, Jared Markle, and your beloved host, the pimp hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. Yes, indeed. All right. I am back. We are back. And uh, it's it's actually keep your head on a swivel. I did uh, that on I, purpose. I, yeah. Okay. So here's the deal. Uh, I'm going to be quiet. And Jack Zach is going to tell us a little story. So, Zach, tell us a little, a little story. little story or, or a big story? It's actually a very little story, but it has, like, deeper meaning behind it. Or whatever you want to phrase. So the other day, I was at the grocery store, right? I was just doing my yep. thing, getting a couple things, picking up. And I was looking at my phone, put my phone back in the car as I was walking out of the store. And as I was walking out of the store, you know how they have those little concrete pillars to keep people from ramming the doors or whatever? Yeah. 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 So there was a dude on my left just kind of leaning there, chilling against the pole, right? And I was like, I guess he went for somebody to pick him up or whatever, right? That's weird, yeah. But of course, because I'm you know, an aware person, I keep my eye on him because he's the only person there. And I'm walking, I got my little cart. And, like, as I'm passing him, like, right about the time where you think that, you know, somebody can't see you anymore, he takes off a dead sprint right at me. And I was like, oh, crap. And I, I like, I was like, am I really going to have to do this? I, I swung my freaking cart, like, in his direction. And he ran right past me towards his girlfriend who was getting out of the car, of her car. Oh. And I was like, if I had been a little more twitchy, I would have punched him right in the face. Yeah, because yeah. he like he like he ran right right past me and See, and but, you, know, you know what what's what's important about that story not just your story is the uh, uh how humans in our world have become so myopic and so self-centered and so oblivious of everything is me yeah. no one ever thinks how are my actions will my actions affect anyone else no, you know, the normies, the, the Karens, the whatever, they don't think, you know, if, if I start acting crazy in the middle of the store, somebody might think I'm crazy and, you know, no, every, everyone is so focused on themselves and what they want. They never, they never stop to think, will my actions affect anyone else or will my actions be perceived or whatever? And I'm glad you didn't have to shoot that guy. Um, but I'm glad that you were aware that, that you know, you may have had to shoot that guy. Yeah. Uh, like, the, the reason I bring this up is because mm. the whole situation obviously ended up being nothing. Mm. But everything about the situation up to the part where he ran past me is the classic, you know, freaking getting punched in the back of the head. Somebody freaking. Guy just, yeah, guy just hanging out. Or whatever. Yeah. Not acting yeah. like a normal customer. Yeah. Because normal customers at grocery stores don't just lean against a post. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, it, I'm glad that that worked out for you, and I'm glad that you were paying attention. Yeah. But it's like the average person, like, would have just seen that guy, and I got, oh, whatever. 
and then like walk past and probably wouldn't have even noticed that the guy ran past them to go to go to the car or whatever. It's like until they were shocked, it, yeah. Until it was too late, you know, if it, something had happened. I have a story. Go ahead. Well, speaking of grocery stores, grocery stores. So, my wife, being a crazy person, decided that on our way out of town, leaving Jared's house, that instead of just getting on the highway and going home, it would instead be better to stop at the grocery store because it's it's less expensive there than it is at home. So we're going to get it now instead of being on the road where we should be since we're already behind schedule, we're going to stop at a grocery store. So this is Sunday, Mother's Day, around three something in the afternoon, right? Well, it was Mother's Day, so you have to get let her do whatever she wants to do. Remember? Yeah. Um, so my question is to this, and, and maybe... It could be that most people were caught off guard this year because everybody kind of in their mind thinks that Mother's Day is like the 13th, 14th, 15th kind of a thing, you know. It's the second Sunday of May, but since the first, since May 1st was a Sunday this year, it came kind of quickly, right? But, uh, you know, on, on one hand, I'm willing to give people the benefit of the doubt but then on the other hand i'm thinking how pathetic as a as a culture or a community or society is it when you go into a grocery store on sunday mother's day and the whole balloon flower you know you know they're in smiths where they make the mylar balloons and they have the flowers and all that stuff yeah i get them for cookie yeah it's it's swamped it, it, it's literally like elbow to elbow people crushing in trying to get the two little girls the two teenage girls who are making mylar balloons right i thought is this indicative of our modern society how we don't think ahead or prepare for anything or is that just no, uh, well, a standalone? Because Maybe. it wasn't. You could say, "Oh, well, it was the one, it was the dads who forgot, right?" Oh no, was it just? It no, was like just it was ev It was a mixture of everything. It was older women, younger women, teenagers, men, you know, kids. Uh, it was every demographic was crushing into the balloon flower area. It's like we, we couldn't get to the deli area because there were so many people crushing in around the flowers and balloons for Mother's maybe, Day. Maybe they were thinking ahead and they were getting the balloons for Father's Day. Mm. Answer is no, that is not we the case. We just have to assume that, that people are, we just have to give them the benefit of the doubt. So, and I thought, you know, you wonder why the electric goes out and people ha start having a stroke. You know, the electricity goes out and within 12 hours. People are pulling out their hair and, you know, freaking out. Uh, maybe it's because people don't have the capacity to anymore to prepare for anything, to think beyond the moment. It's kind of like we just talked about with Zach about how there are people that, that move around in public and never stop for a second to think, how will my actions affect others? Yeah, it's there's no how will my affection actions uh, affect others, and I can't see beyond five minutes from now. So, oh, today's Mother's Day, and it's three fifteen in the afternoon. Let's all flood into the grocery store to buy. And who's and here's the other thing I'm thinking is who in the F is waiting until three o'clock in the afternoon to buy Mother's Day flowers? And because as we were, were coming in, they were on the way to the Mother's Day dinner. Yeah, we had to stop and like let people come out and everybody who came out had Mylar balloons and flowers and stuff. And like, I was like, what? I'm usually the night before guy, like the day before is usually when I'm in there looking for stuff. So we actually were really good this year. Yeah. I got it on Friday. Yeah. I got the Mother's Day stuff on Friday. That. And so. it turned out that I actually had 
a Mother's Day gift from like months ago that I picked up because it was it was from Ruth to Alex. Yeah. And I found it down here. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah that thing. <laughs> I don't know. That's just a quick aside. All right, let's go ahead and get into the Duracoat fire, finished firearm section. Hold on a sec, Zach. Don't play the music yet. I think that we should put a pin in the rabbit hole of do humans have the capacity to, um, to, to I guess, a forethought? Plan. Yeah, f- uh, that's to right. Plan yeah, ahead. It's a great one word. Or, yeah, do humans have the capacity of forethought anymore? It's a great rabbit hole to go down. Yeah. Now you can play. I was about to say, can I play the music now? Yes, no. you may. Yeah. All right. All right. On the wrong show notes. You're on the wrong show notes. There you go. So uh, today, I, uh, well, it wasn't actually today. It was a while ago, last week, I was looking at, at my various gun projects. And you guys know this last summer was kind of the, uh, it was the, the summer of the FNFAL. It was the summer of Rhodesian love. It was the summer of love for Rhodesia, yeah. for the right arm. And we did a lot of things. Uh, one of the things I did, I did an authentic Rhodesian paint job on the, the SA-58, the FAL. And then what we tried to do is we tried to mimic a Duracoat job. So we went to Duracoat and we said, hey, what colors do you have that will mimic the, uh, the original Rhodesian? And what Steve told us, rest his soul, Steve said, uh, Vortex Green and Russian Special Forces Yellow, right? So we did, I did a couple of AKs in the, uh, the Vortex Green and Russian Special Forces Yellow. And the Russian Special Forces Yellow kind of mimics the Rhodesian yellow baby poop color. Uh, and, of course, the Vortex, uh, it mimics the jungle green or the, the, the woodland brush jungle green kind of a color. So I was out the other day. Uh, working with the FAL, with, with the DS Arms SA-58, to be specific. It's the DS Arms SA-58, and that is a faithful reproduction of the original metric pattern Belgian Fusil Automatique Le Guerre, the right arm of the free world. And I was thinking... Look at where we are today in our world. Look at where we are as as shooters, as, you know, I don't want to, uh, oh, what do I want to say that's nice? As, as persons who are using firearms in, in, in mortal combat and self-defense. Now, we've been using the U.S. government, uh, the U.S. Army has been using the 556 for so long now that the 762 kind of seems like an antique or people view the 762 nato or the 308 i know they're not exactly identical but they're close enough uh they view that as a distance cartridge they're like well if i wanted to shoot someone far away then i would use the 308 the 762 nato because because that's that's a rifle for distance if I showed you a rifle like an FAL, that was it, you know, obviously it's chambered in 762 NATO, you you'd you'd be thinking, or at least most modern Americans would be thinking, yeah, well, yeah, if you had to shoot people long a long ways away, that's what you'd use. But for close up, for close quarters combat, you wouldn't you wouldn't use that. Why? Why wouldn't you? Pierre like, um, because and one of the becauses that i encountered was people calling the 308 a quote heavy recoiling gun it's a heavy recoiling cartridge and i got to thinking i was like "Mm, we need to pump the brakes on that one we can't let that just go we can't let that cliche just (laughs) 
pretend to become truth. The 308, the 762 NATO, is not a heavy recoiling cartridge. Now, the, the 556 is a light recoiling cartridge. But when it comes to, and someone else had said something like, well, yeah, the, uh, when we were doing the thing with Marty, with the AK corner, yeah. someone commented about how the AK is a, the AK-47 or AKM is a heavy recoiling gun. Like, no. That's what my wife thinks. Yeah. That, <laughs> no, 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 no. That is a standard. That's standard. If you want to talk about heavy recoil, you're going to go to 30 out six and start moving up. Seven millimeter Remington Magnum, 30 out six, 300 Winchester Magnum, 338, uh, 338 Federal. Now, I'm not going to go for the crazy long distance stuff like the Shy Tex and Lapuas and you know, the Barretts and things like that. That's that's another thing. But when it comes to rifles, the the FNFAL, it's not a heavy recoiling gun if you know how to shoot a rifle if you know how to put your body mass behind it. And something that uh, if you did not study it or if you've not read about it during the Rhodesian Bush War, those guys from the very beginning through the very end were carrying FALs, right? And you say, yeah, because when they had to engage the enemy, the enemy was long way away, four or 500 yards, and so they needed that long distance. No, it was exactly the opposite. If you read stories, I've read uh, you know several, um, Two really good biographies are Bush War Operator by A.J. Balaam and Fire Force by Chris Cox. Fire Force by Chris Cox and Bush War Operator by A.J. Balaam are good books, first-person accounts of what was going on in Rhodesia in the Bush War. And what you'll find is that when it came to the FAL, they weren't engaging the enemy at hundreds of yards, hundreds of meters, you know. They were engaging him in close combat in the brush, in the jungle, in the bush. And so and they were would uh, both of them said that their average engagements were within 25 to 50 meters and sometimes even closer. So but they used the FAL. They used a 762 NATO massive monster recoiling cartridge. It's not really a monster recoiling cartridge. And they, and they learned, I, I'm not sure if it was Chris Cox or, or Balaam, that one of the first ones that, that mentioned, that they practiced to sh- just throw the gun up in the shoulder, lean into it, and double tap. They would look through the sights. They would silhouette the enemy. They'd throw in their shoulder, and then wham, wham. Like you can't double tap with a three oh eight. It's too powerful. The yeah, you know, the first shot will be here and the second shot will be up in the sky. So what I did, because I'm that guy, uh, I took the rifle out and I took a video camera. And I did it in full motion and I did it in slow motion. And then after I did it in slow motion, I pulled a screenshot. And I have a screenshot that I shared on socialist media today, leaning into the FAL and firing two shots at a target. It was about 20 yards away as fast as I could. There's two pieces of brass in the air separated by about six feet from each other. The muzzle is still leveled. The muzzle is leveled with the target. And you can see the dust behind the target as the bullets have passed through. I don't know how to explain it or demonstrate it any better than that. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the moral of today's Duracoat finished firearms, since we're talking about firearms that are finished in Duracoat and so on and so forth, is that before you stop and say Derp Derp is a heavy recoiling cartridge, you might want to think, are you using the tool in the correct fashion? Yeah, if you're trying to stand up erect, you know, and or even leaning backwards a little bit and you've got the 308 in your shoulder and you pop the trigger and it pushes you backwards, you're like, wow, that's a heavy recoiling cartridge. Try leaning your shoulders forward six inches. Try making sure that the that the stock is tight against your shoulder and your cheek is down against it. 
you'd be amazed. You might just be amazed. Uh, and uh, as a quick aside, uh, our friends at DS Arms a couple of months ago had their uh, they had their social media, specifically their Instagram, pulled down by the Nazis on Instagram because they claimed that they were trying to sell guns online. So what they had to do is they had to do they had they appealed it and and of course Which is not I, illegal. Yeah, IG did exactly what they what you would expect them to do. The IG is like, "We don't care. You're bad." So they had to start over from scratch. They had something like 56,000 followers and now they have 3,000 or something. Uh so if you if you have an is, you know, a lot of you guys are like, "I don't do that socialist media crap." Okay, cool. But if you do, if you're listening to me and you have an Instagram account, be a, a Caucasian person and uh, go over to IG and follow them so that they can build their numbers up because they are good guys. The guys at DS Arms are good people and they make good guns. Uh, and then once you get one of their guns, you'll notice that if it's black, it is a black Duracoat because DS Arms uses Duracoat in their factory when they make factory guns. How righteous is that? I, I think it is tremendously righteous. So we got Duracoat, we got DS Arms. They're, they go together like lamb and tuna fish, man, like peas and carrots, like peanut butter and jelly. There you go. All right, next up, I see notes that I did not put there. All right, yeah. I was going to say thank you for everybody who participated in the Shipping Ogre Birthday Bash last week. You should all have your stuff by now. And if you want to get in on a different kind of bash, have you gotten your? Uh, have you reserved your seat for the Precision Rifle course yet? Hmm? I don't have know. That? Have you? Yeah. Have you done that? That is a fantastical question. The Precision Rifle class is going to be the uh, first weekend of August this year, 2022, right here in Wyoming. Uh, we have a thousand plus yard range. Uh, we get to shoot. You will get to shoot in the in the wild, wonderful uh, wilderness of Wyoming. <laughs> that's Got, a th wild, wonderful wilderness. Oh, that's yeah. right. That's right. Uh, the your your tuition includes range fees. It includes all the obviously the the course material and, and the teaching, and it also includes six meals. Dinner, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and breakfast, lunch, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And it also includes your accommodations. Uh, you will be staying at the Mountain Lodge, at the Hanging Bull Mountain Lodge in beautiful Wyoming. Uh, so quit making excuses, reserve your seats, and we will see you there. We'll see I'm you there. really excited about this course. It's uh, one of my favorites that we do for you guys. And uh, we've got some repeat students that also think it's their favorite as well, which I appreciate. Um, if you want to join in on it, go to shopsotg.com. And if you can't find it just by scrolling, then search the word rifle on the site and it'll pop up there. And the uh, picture says precision rifle, the spirit of the rifleman. That's right. All right. Uh, SDS imports torture test video discussion. That is what my notes say. Yes, so, I want to uh, I want to ask you a question about yes. torture tests. What makes a good torture test? Ah, uh, what makes and, a good torture test? And while you're talking about what makes a good one, uh, what are some pitfalls to a, a torture test that is not planned or is not done with proper form? Form's not really the right word, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, the proper technique. Okay, uh, we we recently did a, a torture test on the 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 SDS imports Zagana PX9 Generation Three or the TSOS PS9 Generation Three, uh, and I, I did deliberately plan this out. Uh, I planned it out, uh, wrote some notes, and and one of the, the the main things or the main pitfalls that I believe a lot of people do is a they watch too many videos on YouTube. And so they decide that they're a YouTuber also, or so they go out and they try and emulate what they saw, which I guess is is typical human fashion. You know, we when I was in my twenties, I'm sure I did the monkey see monkey do thing. You know, I saw someone else do it, and I thought, oh, that was cool. I'm going to go do that myself. 
Uh, but whether it's a 500 round test or a 700 round test or a thousand round test, you got to stop and say, okay, well, what am I doing here? Well, what do you mean? You're going to, I'm going to shoot a thousand rounds. It's going to be badass. It's going to be cool, man. And I'm going to get all kinds of views on my Insta garbage uh, channel. And yeah, but if you're going to press the trigger a thousand times, you you have the opportunity you have if you have a thousand rounds of ammo you can either press the trigger one thousand times extremely well or as well as possible uh, as well as you have the capacity to do you can make one thousand deliberate purposeful well done trigger presses or you can just shove your your booger pick into the uh into the the trigger guard and start jacking the trigger as fast as you can because I don't know why. Uh, I really don't know what you prove by just pointing a gun at a dirt berm and, and jacking the trigger as hard as you can. But here's what I know based on my 30 plus years of teaching people. If you take a thousand rounds and you decide we're going to burn it down and you have all your bros stuff and mags and you're just feeding you mags and you're just like what you're going to have at the end of that thousand rounds is a phenomenal flinch you will have developed a phenomenal trigger flinch you will have you will have trained your hand to do so if you do something a thousand times in a row incorrectly or crappily what you will do is you what you will have done is you will have trained your finger to do that crappily and now it's going to take you another thousand rounds to, of well, good probably two thousand to undo purposeful it. deliberate trigger presses to undo the flinch that you just trained your body because that's what you're doing you're training you when you when you do something over and over again you know, when, when you do repetitions, you're either going to train yourself to do it correctly and you're going to improve or you're going to teach yourself. That's why instructors will tell students who, who don't think that you have to practice and try and get good before you come to training. That you go to training to learn how to practice. You don't practice so you can go to training. Those, that's the opposite of correct. So if you're out there and you're thinking, well, I, I really want to go to a training class and I know Paul's right and, and I should, but, but I don't want to go yet because I'm not good enough, I'm not that good yet. So I'm, well, I'm going to go on my own and practice. Then I'm going to go to training. I thought this when I was 18, 19 years old, I thought that's what you should do. I was wrong and, and I didn't have someone like me to say, don't do that. That's wrong. That's the opposite of correct. Ladies and gentlemen, if you got a thousand rounds to burn, why not make a thousand perfect trigger presses or as near perfect as you can make them? Why not? I mean, some of your trigger presses will be really fast and right on top of each other. Some will be really slow. Some will be moderate, whatever. What I did with that, torture test is I tried to not only test the gun, but test myself. So I did two handed holster. I did holster drills. I did two handed shooting. I did single hand, right? I did single hand left. Uh, I did awkward shooting positions. I did distance shooting. I backed up, you know, to 20 yards, 25 yards, all the way up to 50 yards. Uh, I did lots and lots. Of, if you have a thousand rounds to shoot to in today's world, that's an investment. It's not like it was, you know, 10 years ago where you get a thousand rounds of nine for 180 bucks or something or 179 bucks or 150 bucks. That wasn't that big of an investment. And you're like, yeah, okay. But you still have your investment in time and you still have your investment in, in the physical action. And if you're just jacking on the trigger as fast as you can to prove a point that you can shoot I don't know that you can make the rounds come out of the gun fast. I don't know. You know. Um, you're going to be done and you will have developed a tremendous flinch 
And to be quite frank and honest, you will have wasted an opportunity to improve uh, or to solidify the skills that you already have. So, uh, and also when it comes to, to torture testing guns, just what what is the what should the gun realistically be expected to do? You know, under what realistic conditions? If you're like, I'm going to I'm going to fly over the this parking lot in in a helicopter. I my buddy has an R44 and we're going to fly over the hell the parking lot and I'm going to throw the gun out of the helicopter into the parking lot. And then my friend who's on the ground is going to go find it and pick it. It's like, stop. Just stop. That's not what the gun is designed for. You know, that that's and and it and if you do that and it breaks, then you didn't, you know, it's like if the gun's gonna drop, how far is it gonna drop? The the farthest it should ever drop is from your chest height to the ground underneath your feet. Because that's realistic, right? A a three story drop is not realistic. You know, that that would be like taking. I a might full- be throwing it to my friend. You don't know. I might yeah. be throwing it over a balcony, and my friend forgot to catch it. Yeah, if you're throwing then, guns to people, you should you should stop yourself and go get better hobbies. But um, that's like taking a Ford F one fifty and draining all the oil out of it, and and then going out to the backcountry roads and redlining it, or putting it in. Or it's like taking a standard transmission car and putting it in second gear and stomping the pedal until you're going 50 miles an hour, and then the engine seizes, and you're like, see? I knew it was crap. I knew this thing was garbage. Like, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be used, and you're wrong. So, uh, yes, if you decide you need to, you need to emulate your favorite uh, YouTube star or Instagram model and uh, do a torture test, use your brain. And use the available ammunition to do good things. Uh, and also, uh, if you've never been to a training class, go to a training class, then practice. It's kind of like people who think that they have to get strong first before they start going to the gym. Well, I don't want to go to the gym yet because I'm not that strong. So, what do you have to? You have to huh? do that. You have to, yeah. You have to do the thing to do the thing. It's like, just go. Everybody's a beginner once, you know. But, but you're, you're a student for life. That's right. All right. And so, that's a wrap. And that's a wrap. Drop microphone. <laughs> oh, sweet Buddha. It is May, according to the calendar. Uh, not according to the white crap on the uh, on the on the lawn out front it's not may but according to the calendar it's actually may uh which means that the nra annual meetings and exhibits are going to be coming up here the last weekend of may uh it's 27th through the yeah, 29th right memorial yeah. day weekend memorial day is the 30th so the the nra annual meeting and exhibits is 28 29 no 27 28 29 and our friends at high point firearms promised to be there they have promised that they will be there and they promise that they will have new stuff to show you so uh, i'm gonna say hold them to their promise and <laughs> and of course if you're at the nra meeting and, and exhibits it would be a good thing if you would go to all of our sponsor booths sds imports is going to have what jared what are they giving away they're giving away free microphones. So they free microphones free microphones so that yeah. Jared Markle has a voice. We appreciate that. They're giving away a uh, collaborative thing with a, it's going to be a pistol that has the accurate sights on it from night vision. That's right. The it's it's going to be developed a, by student of the gun. Yours yeah, truly, it's going to be a PX nine yeah. gen three with a three. stainless steel slide, which I believe is what you did the torture test. on. That's right? what I did. I did the torture test. Yeah, and it'll have a stainless steel slide and night vision sights. Did night vision put, tritium sights the torture installed test, on it. Were there accurate nope. sights? Uh, Dave wanted me to do it as completely is out of the box. Is, yes, <gasps> I did it completely it as is slow motion out of the box. 
Rocks. I'm watching the video right now. Yeah. If you guys have not seen that video of this pistol that is going to be given away, yeah. it'll have a minor upgrade or major upgrade, I guess, depending on how you want to look at it. Yeah. It will have some night sights on there. And uh, like we just said, but if you want to watch this video, it's on studentofthegun.com. There's an article that's called Zagana PX9 Torture Test. You can get it there, or you can go to the Student of the Gun Juxi channel. That's J U X X I dot com. You mm-hmm. can find the Student of the Gun channel on there, and the video is there as well. That is right. That is right. All right. So, uh, whether it's crossbreed holsters or Duracoat firearm finishes or Brownells, uh, who's coming up right after Zach reminds you, if you're a new listener, what you should do. Attention, new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. Yes, indeed. Indeed, yes. That is what you should do. That is what you can do. And uh, we're going to move on now to our Brownells bullet points of the week. Boom, 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 boom. All right, I'm going to give you a couple of things. Uh, um, Number one, Brownells also did a special Cinco de Mayo, May 5th special where they put their Agule, Agula, Aguila. Yeah, it depends on where in the United States you're pronouncing that as Agula. It's either Agula or Agula or Aguila. Hey, hey there, uh, Zach. How how do you uh, pronounce that? How do you pronounce Eagle in Spanish, in Espanol? Aguila. 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 So Aguila. So Agui, Aguila means eagle in Spanish. So uh, in honor, they, see, they did a little thing there. They did a little Mexican ammo thing. <laughs> but it's still on sale. Uh, the Aguila, twenty a 500 round box of 22 long rifle. So if you be looking for some long rifle, uh, they've got it on sale still, which is a good thing. And that brings me up to, well, it brings me to a, uh, a discussion. Since we're talking about rimfire ammo, there, someone recently uh, suggested in a video that they did uh, that uh, a, a Ruger 22 Winchester Magnum rifle would be good for home defense. <sighs> so this is why I take a deep breath and remember that this is a public broadcast and that the children might be listening. So many, 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 many moons ago, uh, I had a good friend named Walter Rausch, who was one of my mentors. He's He's since gone to his reward and he doesn't have to deal with the horse crap of planet earth anymore so congratulations to him but he was reviewing two taurus handguns now back in the day ladies and gentlemen back in the day when i was coming up in the 80s and 90s if you wanted a quote pocket pistol there were two pocket pistols that were available two styles or brands or models right i I guess not models but basically styles companies would make their pocket pistols in either 22 rimfire or 25 acp and you're like what about 32 Uh, calm down hippie there were some but they were not that prevalent the most prevalent pocket pistols in the late 80s 90s even though even kind of creeping up into the 2000s the 80s 90s and today and today bob fm uh, or jack fm depending on where you live mm-hmm. but uh and walt was comparing these two taurus 
pocket guns. I can't remember their names. It was like probably like the PT-22 and the PT-25 or something like that. And he said, of the two, if I was going to pick one of these for self-defense, I would choose the 25 because even though the cartridges are similar in performance, the 25 being a center fire cartridge is going to be more reliable. Now it's 20 years ago that we all wrote that. But ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand this. In the evolution of cartridges, you guys, my boys, you understand that the first cartridges, the first cartridges used in firearms were rim fire cartridges, right? Yes. And they, what, I'm not talking 22. They had 44 rim fire, and they had you know 32 rim fire. They, rim I fire. I wondered, and I haven't got to ask this yet, but I have wondered why they made the change and who developed the center fire. Two method. reasons. Two reasons. Um, number one, like the original Henry rifles were 44 rim fire. They, two reasons. Number one, the reliability the functional reliability of the rim fire was not what it could have been so they developed a center fire cartridge and the center fire cartridge where a separate primer was far more reliable especially in field conditions than the rim fire and then the second one was the wastefulness of the rim fire brass because let's let's all right, a 22 rimfire is a little tiny piece of brass and we probably most of us don't have much heartburn for letting that fall on the ground right but magnify that times five or even almost times 10 imagine a 44 caliber casing that's that's just one piece no primer you know no separate primer pocket or anything like that can you as the end user, pick that all up, take it home, and reload it and use it again. No, you can't. Because the primer compound is, is put in, in the factory into that. So, they, so people who were out in the world said, yeah, but I don't, want, I don't want to throw all that brass away. I don't want it to be worthless or melt it down and make toy soldiers or whatever. So they developed the center fire because the center fire eased the ability to reload, right? And it was also a more reliable cartridge than the rim fire was. And the die was cast and they never looked back. So the only thing that really exists now in rim fire is what? Recreational cartridges. The 22 LR, the 22 Win Mag, the 17 HMR, those are all recreational cartridges. If you drop the hammer, if you've got a 22 Win Mag or 17 HMR, and you line it up on a prairie dog and drop the hammer and it goes click instead of boom, no harm, no foul. The prairie dog probably will just stand there and stare at you until you chamber another round. Not so in the real world. Especially ladies and gentlemen you guys who are my son's ages and younger you have no idea the struggle that we went through with pocket 22s if you could when i was growing up when i was your age and younger jared when i was zach's age if you could get a pocket 22 to go off for a whole magazine in a row without jamming having a stoppage you had a chubby Okay, you, you'd just be ecstatic. The dopamine was just flowing through your brain. Like, I can't believe I fired seven shots and this thing didn't jam. It's amazing. <laughs> and go back to semi-auto 22s. There are a lot of semi-auto 22 rifles that if you could, if you could actually fire five shots in a row without it jamming, fantastic fantastic the idea that the average adult human should go with a 22 magnum they're like oh it's not a 22 rimfire it's a 22 winchester magnum 
it's still a 40 grain bullet. Yeah, but it's a 40 grain bullet going, going, you know, whatever. 1800. Uh, the 55 grain bullet out of a 223 is going 3100. There's a big difference between 18 and 31. Uh, and all of my kids, when they were children, when they were small, when they were 10, 11, 12, shot ARs. Every one of them. And they were able to handle it. They were able to handle the recoil. So I don't, I don't know what kind of infirm. Maybe if you've, you're crippled up with arthritis and you're really infirm and that's the only thing you can handle, okay, I'll give that to you. But that's not the majority of people. And going out in public and saying, here's my advice to the homeowner. Get a 22 Winchester Magnum Rimfire carbine and make that your home defense gun. Now, is that better than a stick or a Louisville slugger or a nine iron? Sure, it's better than a nine iron, but can you do better than that? Yeah, you can do a lot better than that. And the idea that we should settle for something that's mediocre rather than something that is, that is good or great is kind of ridiculous. And the idea that a person who claims to be a small arms and tactics or firearms trainer would recommend the use of a rim fire cartridge as a self-defense cartridge is criminally stupid. Okay. It's criminally stupid. And that's pretty much all I have to say about that. But if you'd like to engage, turn your mic on if you want to talk to it. But if you'd like to engage in recreational shooting, I encourage you to do that. Rimfire cartridges are for recreational shooting. The reason that they make rimfires is because they're less expensive than center fires. So you can shoot more for less, right? Have a good time. But when it comes to saving your own life, Pick the best thing you can pick. Use the best thing you can use. And a rimfire cartridge is not the best. And cat in the hat, and ladies and gentlemen, that be that. All right, moving on. Okay, uh, now is the time for me to be quiet and uh, remind, let Zach remind you what you can and should do. ShopSOTG.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun. Whether you want to expand your brain, increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the Pimp Hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. That's right. See for yourself, hippies. Don't take my word for it. <laughs> <laughs> don't take Zach's word for it. Uh, see for yourself. And uh, you can see for yourself when you go to the NRA annual meeting uh, what Brownells has got going and what Crossbreed Holsters has got going and what all, because I'm sure they'll all be there because they, they, they want to see you. I don't want to see you, but they want to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I kid because I care. Oh, uh, speaking of kidding because I care, or caring because I kid, let's just just move on. Can we do that? Let's just move. No, on. no. All right, we have to stay here. Overruled. Ah, bing, bang, boom. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for crossbreed holsters. Student of the gun homeroom. And when you uh, go to crossbreedholsters.com to buy a high quality holster, belt, pouch, accessory, be sure to use the promotional code SOTG when you check out. It's going to save you some money, make you a happy camper. And then they will know that you are paying attention to what I say and that, that their support of Student of the Gun is valuable. All right. We got a story here from Amoland.com. This is from Jer Zach's birthday, May 5th. Media attacks sheriff who advocated shooting home invaders. You really got to 
you've got to be a crazy kind of contortionist as a media member of the to say, you know, nah, nah, no, you should read them. Oh, Zach, Jared, Jared, someone. Jared, you can read this, right? Yeah. Your favorite phrase, yours, mine, our favorite yeah, phrase in the whole world. Oh, yeah. Is in paragraph three. Okay. All right. From MLN.com says Santa Rosa County, Florida, Sheriff Bob Johnson describes himself as a cop, not a politician. He certainly has the resume. Johnson started at the Santa Rosa County Sheriff's Office in 1993. He served on the department SWAT team for 20 years, worked as a major crimes detective, supervised a narcotics unit, worked as both a DARE and a school resource deputy, supervised the juvenile unit, served on a patrol as a patrol deputy, corporal sergeant and watch commander, worked in internal affairs, commanded the criminal investigations division, oversaw the department's vehicle fleet, served as the department's PIO, and was finally appointed chief deputy, where he oversaw all aspects of the department. Uh, Johnson was first elected sheriff in 2016 and ran unopposed in 2020. The first time in the county's history, a sheriff has ever run unopposed for re-election. None of this mattered to the woke media when the sheriff, when the good sheriff told the ugly truth about a prolific home invaders arrest during a press conference last week. Johnson was branded a, as reckless, wildly irresponsible, and possibly racist. And according to NPR, he turned Santa Rosa County into the Wild West. There it is. They just can't. They can't stop themselves. Oh man. They have. They have no inner monologue. That it is amazing to me. So that's been going on. That's been the used term since as long as you can remember. To- since as, since I was younger than you. When when I was li- I was living in Florida when Florida passed shall issue concealed carry. And they said, wild and west. it was wild west and blood in the streets. Wow. Yep. The events began when 32 year old Brandon Harris allegedly broke into four homes in Pace, Florida. Allegedly. Yeah. Which is located near Pensacola. Pensacola. Did they shoot place. him inside of the house? Uh, Harris is known as a frequent flyer to Johnson and his deputies. He has been arrested more than 17 times in arrest history that dates back to when he was 13. Man, this guy's just a. Not human piece of filth. Harris once spent six years in prison for home invasion. Of wow. course. Uh, last week, during his most recent home invasion spree, there were sev- there were several active felony warrants for his arrest. So while he was breaking into people's houses, there were felony warrants out for him. Hmm. By all accounts, Harris led Santa Rosa County deputies on a wild chase, leaping fences, kicking doors, and jumping through windows. In one of the four homes Harris invaded, the owner took a shot at him but missed. Harris was caught after he jumped out of a window and into the arms, literally, of a waiting deputy. <laughs> well, that's interesting. It's like, hey, hey, I need to go catch this dude. And then he just jumps in your arms. Yeah. And, oh, well, here we go. During a press conference after Harris's arrest, Sheriff Johnson discussed the homeowner who had fired at Harris, uh, who never came forward. I guess they think that they did something wrong, which they did not. If somebody's breaking into your house, you're more than welcome to shoot them in Santa Rosa County. We prefer that you do, actually. <laughs> uh, so whoever that was, you're not in trouble. Come see us. We have a gun safety class we put on every other Saturday. And if you take that, you'll shoot a lot better. And hopefully you'll save the taxpayers money. And that was all there it took. There you go. Uh, woke mob rule. Florida <clears throat> sheriff urges homeowner to shoot intruders and save taxpayers money. The New York Post headline screamed the next day. A Florida sheriff is advice for homeowners dealing with burglars. Shoot them and save taxpayer money, wrote a Pennsylvania newspaper. National Public Radio went even further calling Johnson's comments wildly irresponsible advice that could cause needless loss of life and aggravated racial tensions. Oh, why would it be racial? That doesn't have anything. If it's if if all the crimes are committed by white people against white people, how is it racial? How would that be racial? NPR should have checked the the booking photo before they placed played the race card. Yeah. Harris is white, as is eighty six. That doesn't matter. Well, white on white crime is racist. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't matter to the media. It's well, not the, his fault. He was born in a white body. 
That's right. He's actually a black man in a white body. No, remember the look at the uh, what, what's our little friend, our little friend's name, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse. Oh, Rittenhouse. Yeah. The the media portrayed him as as a as a white supremacist, as a a white nationalist, because he shot three white guys that were attacking him. But there were people who were out there calling him a racist because the media had said that he was a racist. Well, how were his actions racist? Well, I don't know, but that's what NPR said. Uh, and why, why is NPR still getting taxpayer money to, uh, to foment hate and discontent and spread propaganda and lies? that's what they're for yeah so uh here's the deal yo 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 uh this sheriff's not wrong he's absolutely correct and if someone illegally enters your domicile they have they have surrendered the right uh they they don't get to cry you know uh ladies and gentlemen that's an aggravated felony Illegally entering into your domicile is an aggravated felony. You don't have to read them a, a chapter of the purpose driven life. You don't have to dialogue with them. They have no business being there. They're there to commit a felony. And if they don't want to be shot, they shouldn't break into people's houses. I, I like how the uh, defense attorney that was on NPR, he says it's wildly irresponsible because it essentially encourages people to use deadly force without giving it more consideration. When in that statement did the sheriff say not to consider before you use yeah. deadly force? He didn't. Give, me, There's often times that somebody's not an imminent threat to you. Uh, sheriff Johnson just turned Santa Rosa into the Wild West. So it's um, a defense attorney that used that term. Um, so, I, I mean, this is a good thing to uh, to discuss because obviously, you know, not everybody that's in your house needs to be shot so you do as a person who has a gun and you're no not everybody in your house needs to be shot right. i mean sometimes there's there are people, people in your house that, that aggravate house. the crap out of you, you yeah know, well you don't just there's, shoot sometimes those there's like a, a father-in-law that comes to your house and you didn't know he's coming or whatever and yeah obviously yeah. he doesn't doesn't need to be shot right so that's something that you need to consider we don't uh, shoot at shadows but yeah and the best way to be able to make that decision is to get training Go yeah, through go, the training. Go through training and, and understand. Put yourself in those scenarios before it's actually in real life. Yeah. But ladies and gentlemen, the idea that 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 criminals and felons and thieves deserve they deserve an extra break. Who who's where are these people advocating for the victims of crime? Oh, well, they yeah. You got insurance, just let just let them steal from you. No. Jared, what, what did Jeff Cooper famously say? Who the criminals, things. criminals fear not the courts. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the only way if, to change criminal behavior is if they fear the victim. If they themselves. fear the intended victim. The only possible way to change criminal behavior is if for them to fear the victim. Yeah, there was another famous quote. It says the only thing to fear is the victim itself. That's right. It's a direct That's quote right. from FDR. I'm pretty sure not, but okay. All right. Let me uh, grab this bottle of water. Mm. It, it might have been, you're right. It might have been like Aristotle or something. Yeah, that's who it was. Oh, it was, it was Heraclitus who said, bitches be tripping. <laughs> or was that Ben Franklin? It might have been Ben Franklin that said, bitches be tripping. All right, moving on. Lessons learned. FBI Miami shootout. This book right here. Uh, Here's the dealio. I'm going to tell you how you can get this. You can go to Amazon.com and you can order it and it will ship directly from them. It doesn't ship from Amazon. It actually ships from Edmorales.com. Now, if you, I mean, let me check real quick. Edmorales.com. Uh, all right, let's go to www.edmires.com. 
And let's see if it's there. According to, aha, it is there. So if you just absolutely hate Amazon and you think they all need to die, okay, fine. Uh, you can go to edmirels.com and you can order it from there. But if you just want to go ahead and go to smile.amazon.com and support our favorite charity, Star Treatments, which you should be doing, smile.amazon.com and you should choose the charity star treatments and then every time you buy something then they will donate to startreatments.com which is if you forgot about it shame on you you should not forget about it you can also get a kindle edition if you're one of those guys you're like i want to read it now like this second i want to start reading it you can get a kindle edition of this book but i would suggest getting the paperback uh, so that you can make highlight it and make notes for yourself in the margins and, and so on and so forth. So what is this book about? For those of you that are Gen Z's and millennials, all of this took place long before you were born, long before you were born. So it's history to you. And you're like, well, it's history and history is over and history doesn't matter anymore. And, and we have the internet now and Apple phones and we're all smarter than our grandpas were. No, you're not. You're not smarter than your grandpas were. And uh, we can learn a lot of things, right? Number one, uh, in at the time, in 1986, Miami was very much like the Wild West. But it wasn't like the Wild West because people were walking around with concealed carry permits. As a matter of fact, let's take a look Florida, flow, flow, right, duh, shall issue uh, origin. I'm going to look this up. So, come on, come on. History of, okay. So, in 19, this, this is something that changed. So, in 1986, Miami, Florida was a hotbed for crime. It was crazy. Uh, if you read the book, it says the FBI had various field offices in and around the greater Miami area because there were armored car and bank robberies, essentially either an armored car and or a bank was being robbed once per day. If you're living in, in your city and one of the banks in your city got robbed, People would be talking about it for weeks, right? It'd be like a big deal. You know, robbers hit First Central Bank on Main Street. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, did you hear robbers hit First Central Bank? Holy cow, I was just in there yesterday. I was just in there last week. I could have, it could have been me, right? If a bank gets robbed in your city, it's a BFD if it happens one time. Imagine living in a city, a greater metropolitan area where there was a bank robbery or an armored car robbery every day. That's a lot. So in 1986, there was no shall issue in Florida. It was the following year. And I'm wondering, was it the public outcry over the crazy, rampant, freaking stick em up robberies? People said, you know what? This, well, we've had about enough of this crap. Could it be, Jared? I don't be. know. I don't know. It could be. It could be. So th that's why Ed Morales was down in Miami. He was part of a unit that was a basically bank robbery, uh, armored car. They were a robbery unit. And they were focused on banks because the FBI investigates bank robberies and armored car robberies. Right. The two bad men, uh, Platt and Maddox. Uh, it was William Platt. It was William Maddox and Michael Platt. Bad guys. These guys were uh, U.S. Army veterans, and uh, they were, well, essentially the the uh, the uber bad guys. They had no compunction or compulsion compunction about dropping the hammer. 
they had murdered at least, I believe, they were wanted for, they, well, first of all, the FBI didn't know who they were. They knew that there were two bad guys who would go into banks with ski masks on or they would rob armored cars with ski masks on. They didn't have a good description of them. The very, because of the state of, of anxiety that people get in when they're being robbed or whatever, they were described as black males, as Latino males, and as white males. You know, they were anywhere between five foot ten, six foot two, two hundred pounds to three hundred pounds. You know, people they didn't, but they just knew there were two guys that they always they basically they fired their guns every time they committed a robbery. They were not shy about shooting. They had they shot and murdered an armored car driver. They knew that. What the FBI didn't know for sure was that they had shot and murdered uh, a kid, I don't know, 18, 19-year-old kid, to steal his car, uh, and they used that car to commit um, robberies as a getaway vehicle. Then they shot another guy and left him for dead out in the Everglades, stole his car, but he didn't die. And that was the first guy to give them a good description uh, of the assailants, two white men, late 30s, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the big, the BFD was that they gave a complete, he gave a complete description of his stolen car, including license plate. So on the morning of April 11th, 1986, the F, there were uh, 14 members, I believe it was 14 members of the FBI were out in the metropolitan Miami area patrolling around banks where these guys had previously hit. And they were hoping to maybe catch a glimpse of them. They were on a, a ro- what they call a rolling stakeout. Now, as somebody who is a popo, uh, and if you ask anybody else who's, who, is, who is a police officer, how many times you do a stakeout and you end up catching the bad guys or seeing them? It's a small percentage. Most of the time, you, you go somewhere and you wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, and nobody shows up, and then you sign out and say, oh, well, that didn't happen. Or you patrol around an area, look and look and look and look and look and you don't see them. Well, within 30 minutes of them being out on the street, they saw these guys. What? And not only that, they were not only did they see the car that matched the description, the stolen plates on the stolen car were there. Same plate. They didn't even switch the plates. That's how lazy they were or brazen. They were so brazen. They're like, we don't care if the cops say it or not. Screw them. So long story short, they end up and and these guys like they know they're hyper violent. They know that they're always armed, heavily armed, and they know that they're not, they don't hesitate to drop the hammer to pull the trigger. So they start following these guys and they get behind them. And the guys, they make them or they, they realize they're being followed. So they slow way down to like 10 miles an hour. Can imagine following as you're a cop, you're following a car and they slow down to 10. Well, the reason you slow down to 10 is because no one in the world who's behind you if you slow down to 10 is not going to pass you they're going to pass you and flip you off and call you an idiot like what are you doing why are you driving 10 miles an hour down the road but instead you know obviously since they're the fbi and they're following these guys and they want to take them they're not going to just pass them (laughs) say bye see you later so then the guys make three right turns which is another classic how do i know i'm being followed if, if you think you're being followed, make three right turns. If the car's still behind you, you're being followed. Because there's only one reason that they would have made three right turns when you made three right turns. It's because they're behind you on purpose. So they get into a neighborhood and they're heading towards an interstate. And they make the decision, we can't let these guys get out on the highway. If we let them get out on the highway, it's going to become not only a high-speed chase, but they're probably... They will, they will shoot, and innocent people will get shot. So they make a decision to do a traffic stop. 
But the tra- the traffic stop, you know, they tried to do a felony stop. But the bad guys, see, something you need to always remember if you're trying to stop a bad guy is they get a vote. If some jackhole, uh, a phallus with ears, does a YouTube video and tells you to use a 22 rifle for home defense, remember the bad guy gets a vote. And uh, in this case, they got a vote and they decided they weren't going to stop. So they started ramming and slamming into the FBI cars. Eventually, there were enough FBI cars, uh, there was four of them, to force them off the road. The car that Ed Morales was in uh, crashed. The car that the bad guys were in crashed. The, gar- the car that uh, the other, another FBI guy was in was crashed. And essentially, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but the bad guys, like after they, sh- they crash into a tree and then they shake the, the dust you know, off, they start shooting immediately. They open fire uh, on the agents. Uh, Michael Platt had a Mini-14 rifle. Now, if you watch the movie, the made-for-TV movie, you would believe that that gun was the folding stock A-Team version that had been illegally converted to full auto. It wasn't. There's actually a picture of that gun. Jared, you see it? It's, uh, it's photo exhibit number 15. It was a stainless steel Ruger model ranch rifle. It didn't okay, have a folding it? stock. Um, it's in the very beginning. It's it's there's color photos. Yeah. Exhibit one, two, three, four, five, fifteen. It shows the the weapons that the bad guys possessed, and then it showed the weapons that the FBI had in their possession that day. Uh, one of the things that and there's, I studied this a long time ago, like in the early nineties. I studied this. And when I say I studied it, I mean, I had to write a paper about it. I watched the FBI's video. The FBI did an after action video. Then there was a made for TV movie. And so we watched both of them. We kind of compared them to each other. Uh, We read the case history and so forth. And one of the things that the one of the criticisms that Ed attacks in the book is he said that everyone says we were outgunned that day. And, And if you look at it, you look at that photo and you're like, oh, well, it doesn't really seem like they were outgunned when there was like, look at all these revolvers and shotguns. And one, there was an agent in the field with an MP5 SD. There was an agent in the field with a, a Colt AR-15. Unfortunately, the guy with the MP5 SD and the guy with the Colt AR-15 were not close enough to get involved in the firefight. They were like several blocks away when it started. And they were, you know, it's kind of like calling the police the, the moment the, the, the shooting starts. They'll come and they'll be there and they'll clean up when it's done. But uh, if, if they're five minutes away, they might as well be on the moon, right? So Ed, and Ed, he points out, he said, look, we were all carrying what we were allowed to carry what was authorized carry gear at the time, whether it was, you know, revolvers or or pump action shotguns or whatever. Uh, Now, I would say everybody on the stakeout should have had MP5s or everybody on the stakeout should have had Colt AR-15s. That's me saying that. But at the time, the thought process was we're all well armed. We have our 357 wheel guns. We have our Remington pump action shotguns. You know, we're well armed. The bad guys decided that they weren't going to quit. And what's the story is important. And the story is basically the first two thirds of the book. And then the last third of the book is the after action. It is the mistakes made. You know, what did they do well? What did they do poorly? What could they have done better? And I'm not going to get into the 40 Smith and Wesson thing. Um, I'm not going to get into the, you know, nine versus 40 or whatever. But something that 
the one of the reasons that I say every firearms instructor, every small arms and tactics trainer needs to get this book, read it uh, with a pen and a highlighter. So there were 10 people involved in that eight FBI agents and two bank robbers in that shooting in that shootout, right? Only one of the FBI agents didn't fire his gun because he lost his gun in the crash and he was essentially disarmed. He crashed the car and was immediately opened fire on and he went for cover and he was not able to return fire because he had no gun. Uh, and he was injured by um, shrapnel uh, fragmentation uh, from the bullets. Um, but of the 10 people, of the 10 guys that were there, five out of the 10 sustained either an injury to their hand or their arm, putting them down to, reducing them down to one-handed. Ed Morales was shot through the left forearm. It broke both the radial and ulnar bones. Uh, I think it's radial and ulnar. Uh, broke both bones in his forearm, and his left arm at the very beginning, within one minute of the firefight, was done. It was no longer going to be useful to him. He could not command it. Hanlon was shot in the right hand. Gordon was shot in the right hand. Doves, Jerry Doves had a pistol bullet, a rifle bullet passed through his handgun right in the, where the slide frame area meets. Uh, Platt was shot in the right arm and the right hand. Radius and ulna, by the way. Or you Radius know. and ulna, yep. It's both of them right there. How many times do you guys go to the range and practice shooting one-handed? How many guys, times you guys go to the range and practice shooting with just your left hand? Well, if I, you know, my groups don't look very good when I shoot left-handed, so I don't really practice it because my groups don't look good. Uh, 90% this, and this is another thing he brings up. He goes 90% of the participants were either killed or injured. Four died. And of the, the ones who didn't die, three others were critically wounded. That's an insanely high amount of casualties. Yeah. That's insanely high for the military. It's, it's, it's unheard of for law enforcement. For 90% of the people who participated in the gunfight were either killed or injured. And what's really important, if you look at, when you get this book and you look at the, uh, the photo indexes, it all took place in less than 50 yards. Most of it was less than 25 yards. That, imagine a person with a 5.56 five, rifle 10 yards away from you shooting at you. This was extreme close quarters fighting. But I think the farthest away anyone was was like 40 yards. And that was a couple of the guys that were taking cover from across the street and shooting. Uh, but most of the guys, uh, Manalzi, McNeil, uh, Gore, uh, Grogan, Dove, Hanlon, Morales, they were all within less than 25 yards of the bad guys. Uh, between they, they weren't able to come up with all of the cartridges, the spent cartridges, uh, because, well, a helicopter came in, actually two helicopters came in, and but they were able to find, I believe it was 140 spent cases on scene. The firefight went on for five minutes. You say five minutes doesn't sound like a lot. Most gunfights are over in 30 to 60 seconds max. Most are over in less than 30 seconds. Uh, I believe the gunfight at the OK, the, in the vacant lot behind the OK Corral, took less than three minutes. So in five minutes, two, two FBI agents, two bank robbers were both uh, were dead, and three FBI agents were critically wounded. And so that's one, two, three, four, so, and two others were injured by fragmentation, broken glass, and stuff like that. There's a lot of lessons to be learned. Number one, Ed Morales. Ed Morales, even though he was critically wounded, 
by a rifle shot to the arm. Oh, and one bounced off his noggin, too. Right after the rifle shot hit his arm, he jerked hard because a rifle shot just hit his arm. And because he jerked, the bullet, instead of catching him in the forehead, caught him on the crown of his noggin and uh, gave him a wapo and skidded through his, his basically forehead skin uh, out the back. And uh, that was enough to ring his bell and make him have like tunnel vision and ringing in his ears and uh, so on and so forth. If you, you can imagine, you're like, oh, come on, man, shake it off. Uh, even though Ed, and he is the hero, he, he won't tell people he's a hero and, you know, he's, he's pretty modest in the book. He just says, essentially, I had to dig down and not quit. Because the devil was there and the devil's like, just quit. Just lay down. Just close your eyes. It's over. He's like, no, devil, not going to happen. He fired his shotgun. He was carrying his shotgun when he was hit. And he was able to fire a Remington. All you guys are like, oh, shotguns are too much recoil. And I don't want to use one. He fired his Remington double out buck from his Remington 870 with one hand, his right hand only. And then he shot it. And then he pumped it one handed and he shot it again and so forth. Uh, in, in the book, he said he only really remembered shooting it four times, but it was empty. So he had to shoot shot it five times. He said there was a shot he fired that he has no recollection 36 years later of firing that shot. Wow. And uh, the bank robbers, even after being shot multiple times, uh, Maddox was shot four times or six times, four times in and about the head and shoulders. Uh, uh, Platt was shot 12 times. He had 12 bullet injuries in his body before he finally quit. They had moved into an FBI vehicle from their, their vehicle was trapped. So they went and they got into an FBI vehicle and they were trying to escape and Ed saw that, and he said he was enraged and was not going to let that happen. And eventually, being the only one who wasn't out and inj- either down for the count or dead, he was the only one that could see what was about to happen, that these guys were going to throw it in, in reverse back over the downed FBI agents and drive away. He drew his three fifty seven Smith & Wesson revolver, and with his only his right hand, he said, I found the front sight in the tunnel vision and walked up to them and fired. And he emptied his gun into them, into their head and shoulders and facial area. And finally, after five minutes, it ended. And uh, it's amazing. But he, he goes in there to talk about how people need to understand what's going to happen during, you know, a high, a life and death threat. He talks about the, uh, the adrenaline dump. He talks about the, the chemical dumps into your brain. Uh, he talks about uh, what you can expect from yourself, what you can expect from the bad guys. That was one of the biggest things that comes to me. Goes, everyone's like, well, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. And what nobody ever says is, okay, well, what's the bad guy going to do? Well, what do you mean? They get a vote. You're going to lay down and take it. And sometimes their vote is, I don't want to play. You're like, yeah, but I shot you. You have to fall down now. When it came to Platinum Maddox, like, well, we shot you. You have to lay down now. And they're like, actually, no, we're not going to. They're like, yeah, they were on PCP, man. They had so much dope in their system that, that they couldn't feel anything. Wrong. Toxicology on the, on the dead bank robber showed zero narcotics in their they were system. Just evil. None. They were highly motivated, highly trained. And this is the last thing I'm going to leave you with. So they... Uh, after the after the obviously they discovered who the bad guys were all right okay now we because up to that point they didn't even have their names when they were they were looking for that stolen car right they didn't know the names of the robbers 
had no idea. They were like robber X, robber Y, right? Up until that time, they didn't know their names. They didn't know anything. Now they have them. They're dead. They're right there. So it's easy to identify dead people. So they issued, war you know, they, they, they served search warrants on their residences, and they found receipts where during the previous week, they had purchased 5,000 rounds of ammunition. And they interviewed their girlfriends, and their girlfriends stated that they would go out shooting, quote, all of the time. Now, all of the time to this and all, how many people do you know? They're like, oh, yeah, I go shooting all the time. Well, what, what's all the What's time for you? Yeah. So for some people, yeah, I go shooting all the time is a couple of times a year. <laughs> or I've been shooting my whole life. So were their girlfriends like in, in the dark on it all? Or did they have any inkling? What was the story with there? Uh, they never, I don't think they ever charged them with anything. Uh, I think it was just one of those things are like, what do you guys do? And, and they had some kind of cover story. Like they, they, uh, if you watch the movie, the made for TV movie, they had some kind of cover story where they would buy and sell things, you know, like appliances or whatever. there was one deal where they, I, and this has been a long time since I saw the made for TV movie where they went and some guy had sold them pinball machines or, or sold them something that was, um, basically he ripped them off and those are the wrong guys to to swindle in a yeah. business deal and so they went and put you know pistols or rifles in this guy's face and they're like this but uh you say well okay so they they bought all that ammo they were stockpiling for the apocalypse so they searched both residences for ammo guess how much they came up with i'm doing the the goose egg I'm doing the goose egg. None. Jeez. That means that in that week that they they spent their time training or practicing with 5,000 rounds. They had ammo with them, obviously, in the car. They didn't have 5,000 rounds in the car with them. These And, and, and Ed rightfully po um, points out, he goes, he goes, most police officers don't shoot 5,000 rounds in a career. Right? Oh, sure they do. No, no, no. Most police officers shoot the most rounds they'll ever fire in the police academy. And then from that point forward, either 50 or 100 a year because they have to, because they're made to. Think about 50 rounds. It'd take you 10 years. No, no, 10 times, 10 times 50 yeah, is 500. Math life, live Yeah, life. math life. So, 100 how, years. How, yeah. How long would it take these guys? So the bad guys, these were, as we've talked about, there's there's three kinds of potential felons or bad guys that you're going to encounter. A type one, a type two, and type three. Type one is is a per, is one who will surrender as soon as you respond with force. They're like, hey, man, give me all your money. You pull out a gun. You're like, I don't think so. And they're like, oh, and they run away. They drop their gun. They run away. They drop the knife. They run away or, or whatever. So that's type one. As soon as they're threatened with force, the threat of force will stop them. But that's a psychological stop. They made the decision. Remember, we said the good guys or the bad guys get a vote. Uh, a type two is one who will only stop when they receive some type of injury, not necessarily life threatening. It could be a bullet through the foot or the leg or the hand or the arm. And that's not debilitating, but they're, they're like, owie. Or, or you smack them across the face with a baseball bat or whatever. And they're like, owie, I have received a physical, an injury. I don't want to play no more, right? But that's a psychological stop. They made the decision to stop or to flee. Now, a type three is a felon, is a bad guy who is not going to stop until the engine won't work anymore, until their blood pressure drops to the point that their organs fail or until a projectile interrupts the central nervous system so that the brain can no longer send signals to the body. If you clip the brain stem, boom. Doesn't matter how healthy the body is, it's done, right? Platinmatics were type three attackers. They were not going to stop until they 
received enough physical damage to make them stop. And they did, but it took five minutes, which is an insanely long amount of time for a shooting, for a firefight, for a gunfight. Five minutes is insanely long. Uh, now, like I said, 140 rounds fired in five minutes with revolvers and shotguns and a rifle, but also revolvers. I mean, the FBI guys, their, their round count goes into that. Mm-hmm. And even after Platt's right arm and hand were taken out of the fight, he still continued to fight with his left hand. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of lessons to be learned in this book. If you call yourself a firearms trainer, if you portend to give people self-defense advice with a gun, you need to get this freaking book. You need to read it. You need to learn the lessons. You need to consume it. And uh, it's there and it's available and there's no excuse for you not to. Just go to, uh, did we put an Amazon link? Yeah, we did. There's an Amazon link. So just do it. Like Nike said, just do it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that cat in the hat and that be that bust around tomorrow. Strength is racist. What? Strength is racist. You say, how can that be? Well, there we've got an article from the uh, menstruating news broadcasting company where they're going to let you know. Yeah, all you people, who, you gym rats are apparently all neo-Nazis and didn't know it, but that's okay. Uh, the, uh, the abortion psyop. Yes, I said it. The abortion psyop and how we need to stop being so easily manipulated, but whatever. We have a leadership trait for you, and we also have a fighting fitness for you all coming up tomorrow on Thursday. If you would like to be part of the grad program, Jared right now is going to tell you how you can do that. Super simple. I see you guys that are watching and listening live right now in the Discord. I see you. Out there I know watching. that some of you are not part of the grad program, and we would absolutely love to have you in there with us. You can join it just a trial. You don't have to pay the full price for the first month. Join the dollar trial. Figure out if it's right for you by going to getsotg.com. Follow the directions there. Join the undergrad level, and that will give you access to the grad program episodes. You get a full history of full access to the vault all historical episodes of the grad program the public episodes you get the all historical copies of the um what's it called technical tutor newsletter all of that stuff is accessible in the student lounge uh most of the benefit that i've heard the the biggest benefit that i've heard from you guys is that you get access to the live grad program episodes and also the new ones but i do want to remind you that you've got access to the full vault of everything historical from student of the gun so go to get sotg.com join that trial there and you got 30 days to figure out if it's right for you if it's not that's fine you don't have to there's no strings attached you can you can just move on about your day and we will move on about ours Obviously, if it is right for you, then we'd love to have you in the grad program family. There you go. All right. For the rest of you, I'm going to go ahead and say this. Remember, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. We appreciate your reviews. If you haven't left a review or updated yours recently, head on over to Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast player to voice your opinion. Don't forget to join us at The Student Lounge, a place for like-minded individuals to learn, connect, and support each other. No chicanery will be tolerated. Remember to check studentofthegun.com daily for new free content and giveaways. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. Are you a social butterfly? Connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for new content each and every day at Student of the Gun. Watch Student of the Gun TV and videos from our trusted partners on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Chromecast, and even AirPlay. Go to studentofthegun.com for direct links. And remember, you're a beginner once, a student for life.